The information provided in this podcast is educational and not intended to diagnose or treat medical conditions. Dr. Donnie Wilson struggled for decades to solve her numerous health issues and heal her body. But with focused determination, she healed herself. And in doing so, she discovered the Dr. Donnie Stress Recovery Protocol. On this show, you're going to hear from doctors, nutritionists, and experts, along with Dr. Donnie, who will give practical advice and wisdom to help heal your body. This is how humans heal. Please help me welcome Ellen Goldsmith. She's an acupuncturist and expert in the use of diet with Chinese medicine. Uh, She practices Chinese medicine and acupuncture. She's an author and a professor of Chinese medicine. So thank you so much for joining me, Ellen. I'm so happy that you've come to share with us today. Oh, my pleasure, Donnie. Great to be here. Yeah, yes. And it's so how amazing how you're making Chinese medicine, you're kind of translating it and making it accessible to people and especially the use of foods as Chinese medicine, which I think is really unique. I mean, I know you've been teaching this for Mm -hmm. years, but even for me, um, it feels like a new way of looking at using foods as medicine. Of course, uh, from a naturopathic perspective, I mean, that was my original draw to what I do was how can we use food as medicine? And so I'm so excited. Please share more about how is it that you came to really use Chinese, you know, foods as Chinese medicine? Well, I guess it, it, you know, goes back to playing around when I was going to college and just uh, becoming more of a vegetarian and kind of just wondering what does food do to me? You know, how does it make me feel? How does it change the way I feel? How does it change my perspective on things? And there came to a point like in my mid twenties when I was um, a dancer in New York and I just, my energy wasn't so good. And you know, I kept talking to people about it, like, hey, do you know anybody? And they kept telling me about this woman, Shizuko Yamamoto. She was a Japanese um, shiatsu master and teacher of macrobiotics. So I went to see her, and she gave me a shiatsu treatment, which completely blew my mind and my body and woke me up and made me feel so alive. And she talked to me, and she said, you know, you eat too much fruit, and you don't eat enough vegetables. With every 20-something-year-old, that's usually the statement now. But back then, I was just, how do you know that? And um, so she told me what to do, and I came back and to her later, and um, she treated me again. And I said, will you teach me? I want to learn from you. And she said, no, you have to go to this place called the Cushy Institute, which was the institute to study macrobiotics in the 80s. And I went to Brookline and I learned about food, yin and yang, and macrobiotics is a little different than Chinese medicine, but it still uses the premise that there is an order to things and that it's all about balance. And it's different than like the nutrient balance and the vitamin balance that we talk about in Western nutrition. And so I started learning how to cook and I, I, there was a community of people in New York City um, at that time. And so I had this community that I got to play with and eat with and change my food, which always makes changing our diet much better because it's much more fun to do it with people because food is also social. And I felt, started to feel really good. And then there was a point in macrobiotics about two years down the road where I reached a new plateau and I was kind of like, my energy wasn't so good and I had to change it again. And that was curious to me, you know, like why is a good diet good, you know, over time. Mm. And so I was practicing shiatsu and I um, was always curious in Chinese medicine. So I started studying and I got treatments and that helped me a lot. And I studied with Jeffrey Ewan in New York and different teachers. And then I came out here to Portland and studied at the National University of Natural Medicine in their classical Chinese medicine program. And, you know, Chinese medicine is a way of, of really looking at the world. And the premise is that what's outside there in nature is inside of us. And the goal really is to get back to our true nature so that we're, we can live, you know, we can feel healthy, we can feel in the flow, we can feel more at ease. And of course, life isn't always like that. Um, but, you know, because food was kind of where I lived uh, and what I liked, I just was very curious about it. And uh, so I was asked to teach dietetics at the, in the College of Classical Chinese Medicine and just kept studying it and just 
going, wow, this is powerful. You know, how do we look at food from an energetic perspective, from a dynamic perspective that as we change, our needs change. Even when we eat a good diet and our diet gets better, we're still changing. Mm. And I also saw it as a way to keep practicing Chinese medicine when our patients stop coming to us. Because, you know, I mean, you know, as a, as a physician, people will take your recommendations and then they will, you know, stop, change. They, they go off into their life. Yeah. They go into their life. But the, the thing that we do every single day is eat. Yeah. So, you know, I just felt like, wow, if I could bring this into the kitchen in a way that all of us could access, because all of us, you know, it's mm-hmm. modern times now, but if we go to the way, way, way back to our ancestors, all traditional cultures before industrialization had a tradition of food as medicine, you know, and you can see That's something. Yeah. And you can see the trail of it through the Silk Road, like there are remnants of Chinese medicine and food as medicine in Iran, in Southern Spain with similar, um, you know, there are called vegetable doctors in Iran where they actually talk about the warming and cooling aspects of food. And then I just read that in Pompeii, they discovered remnants of Chinese like food and, and, and such in, in, you know, archaeological digs. So the, the, the Silk Road took a lot of these um, ideas, you know, and people, you know, um, latched onto them as I did. <laughs> well, and to just realize that, like, this isn't a new concept, food as medicine. This is ancient Mm-hmm. This is, this is, you know, just the idea of, and I think when we look at Chinese medicine and reading your book, it reminded me, by the way, this is, this is your book, The Nutritional Healing with Chinese Medicine. Mm-hmm. When I, it reminded me that in Chinese medicine, not only is there an honoring of how food is so important to our health, but also uh, rest and sleep and, and movement and you know, like these, these sort of basic care activities to help us in our daily life. Those are not new concepts. This is back centuries ago in Chinese medicine and carried forward. It's really amazing to think of that history. It, it is. And even in um, the Neijing, which is the classical text of Chinese medicine in the first chapter, Huang Di talks about how in ancient times, people knew the rhythm of of rest and activity. They didn't drink too much wine. They ate, you know, in regular fashion and they lived until a hundred. Now people burn themselves out and die at 50. This was 2,500 years ago. Wow. So, you know, I mean, we're, it shows you that human beings for millennia have been trying to get back to true nature, to, there's always been a struggle to be well and be in rhythm with life, you know, even back then. So, yeah, it's not a new thing. And I think if we recognize that it's part of like, if we really pay attention to nature, a lot of good things could happen. And we would also pay attention to our nature. And I think food can help us do that. It can make us more attuned to our our energy, to our bodies, to even to our minds and our sense of, you know, um, or a sense of ease and, and clarity. Oh, I love that. I, I really am so uh, inspired by now the research in, that shows us how much nature, just say spending time in nature or looking at, even looking at pictures of nature, there's, it just shows us in this research that our brains respond to um, the colors, the shapes, the, the, the uh, chemicals that, that plants put off the, and then of course, if we eat these plants, they affect us. So it's such an interconnectedness with nature that of course, in our busy lives, we, we tend to lose track of that. And, and so how beautiful to, like you're saying, bring attention to that and to recognize that basically in Chinese medicine, it's all about creating this balance, right? Just this, you're alluding to it a little bit. I hear you saying like this, it's all about finding where your body's out of balance and what can you, in the, in the example of food, what could you eat that could b- bring your body back into balance? Or tell me in your words, Ellen. 
Are you well, I, th- I think it, it's a very apt description. You know, um, I mean, we all understand what feeling imbalance is. And I don't know about you, but when I always ask my patients, you know, what their goals are, and oftentimes, no matter what their problem is, they always talk about they want to feel more balanced. They want to feel more calm. They mm-hmm. want to feel less stress, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, just take, I mean, the reason I, in the book where I, I did these 175 recipes, I organized them by season was because we're always in we're always interacting with our seasonal you know attributes like now it's winter and of course with climate change the winters are changing but it is colder the days are shorter um and for our bodies to function well we need to be able to generate our own internal warmth Mm -hmm. right but we can't um we can't be too hot otherwise we dry up because mm. spring is always coming. You know, this is the thing. Life mm. is not static, even though it seems suspended in COVID time. <laughs> I know? love that, though. It's like integrates in this knowledge of change, like sort of acceptance that change is going to happen. Things aren't going to stay the same. Things are going to move and shift. So let's move with it. Let's let's create a balance for this day, for this season, and then know that they could shift again as the season changes. So it's very... um. It helps keep you in the moment too. It does. And I always talk about when I when I'm teaching this to my students, I always say that the beautiful thing about seasonal change is that it gives us an opportunity to recreate over and over again. It gives us an opportunity to leave behind what we don't need. Because as we move from winter, which is like deep storage, you know, hibernation, rest, reflection, and we burst out into spring, you know, and we have to be able to burst out. Our energy needs to kind of lift up and move mm-hmm. out, right? So mm-hmm. if we're turning around all those, you know, like heavy foods and, you know, more fat and longer cooking, you know, into spring, you know, it's going to be harder. We're going to feel like, uh, heavy. We're going to, you know, but we still need to protect ourselves because spring as I said in the old jazz standard, can really hang you up. You know what I mean? It, it, yeah. you know, it's a very changeable season. You have wind, you know, it's rainy, it's hot, it's cold. It's, you know, as my grandmother would say, don't be an idiot, wear your jacket and button it up, you know, when you go <laughs> out there on the streets, especially in New York where it's super windy in March and everything. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's a, a beautiful way for us to just pay attention to ourselves, you know, mm-hmm. and we don't, and, then, and also I think the beauty of this is that you don't have to get fixed. Mm. You know, you don't have to be rigid. You know, I mean, of course, certain health conditions demand us to make really significant changes. And those changes can really improve your health. And we know that in any serious GI issues, you know, autoimmune issues, etc. You know that as a naturopathic doctor. So, you know, I think, um, but it allows people to you know, just be more fluid with food. And also, you know, I always say to people, yeah, you got to learn how to cook. And that's the only good thing about COVID. A lot more people are cooking because then you can really manage your well-being and you can also manage your preferences, you know, what you like to eat. But if you're eating like packaged food, you know, you're kind of a, a slave to salt, sugar and fat, you know, which is hard to break. Well, and I I love how in your book, you really start the reader at the very beginning and say, you know, like, here's what Chinese medicine is. Here's how it relates to foods. Here's these different food options and how they fit into these different categories of cooling and warming. And then lead us into understanding the different ways we could cook those foods and so then you start to really gently guide us into cooking, you know, going and feeling that curiosity and yeah. fun with it, which I really enjoy. And so um, maybe talk us through a little bit more in terms of like, um, what would be a way that a person besides the seasons, like I could see where if it's cold outside, we want to eat something more warming, but what might they see inside their body that might help them know, oh, I need something more warming or more cooling in my food? Well, you know, um, for like people who are hypothyroid, okay. you know, cold, you know, it's just like cold hands, cold feet. You so know, they feel thing. cold. Yeah. They feel cold, you know, and inevitably when I talk to, you know, some of my patients, not all of them, of course, but, you know, what do you have for breakfast? Well, I have a smoothie. 
that's kind of cold. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. You want to have something that's a little bit more warming for yourselves. Or if you are really, you know, those smoothies are the thing because they're easy. I know they're filling. They're, you know, you can get a lot in there. Don't have them ice cold. You know, add in some cinnamon. Add in some mm. ginger. Add in some nutmeg. Add in some warming um, spices that are, you know, will kind of just moderate the coldness of that, right? That's if you're a, a hot person... You probably get more frustrated and irritable more quickly, or you you know you feel angry and you kind of just you know just all this tension. Or if you get like red face or you just sweat easily, then then you're more of a hot type of a person, and you might want to like avoid those foods that you probably love, which are spicy foods, you know. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Thai and Mexican and, you know, spicy Indian and all those kinds of things. And peppers, you know, yeah. And peppers and hot pepper and everything and hot sauce on everything, right? <laughs> so, you know, if you're one of those people and you find like, whoa, you know, I, yeah, I do have a short temper. I mean, not to say that there isn't anything else going on in your life that you might need to pay attention to. And certainly we've all been in a pressure cooker this year. So I want to honor mm -hmm. that, you know. But just to know that things that are more... Um, warming like spicy foods, alcohol, lots of coffee, um, you know, fried foods, greasy foods, things like that are going to add to the kind of heat buildup in the body. And it's kind of like a, a pond, you know, that that's stagnant, you know, thermal pollution, mm -hmm. you know, and that algae mm -hmm. kind of grows, you know. Yeah. In Chinese medicine, we'll call that like a damp heat. So, you, you know, you may have like acid reflux, you may have bowel issues, you may have, um, you know, headaches, you, you know, things like that. So, you know, foods that are, I always tell them, my hot people, just add in green vegetables and have them every day and just cut back on the spicy and the greasy and, you know, a little bit more simple. And, you, you know, you might notice a change there. You might notice, wow, I just feel a little bit calmer. Well, wow, I love that. I love that. And I, and it made me think too, when I was looking at in your book, there was a, a recipe for oatmeal. And I thought to myself, I mean, there's something really simple that probably a lot of people have for breakfast is oatmeal. But again, you, it's what you put in the oatmeal. So maybe that oatmeal might be different based on the season or based on what you need to shift in your body. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, tell, that's tell us more about that. Yeah, like what are what can you just as an example, what can happen with oatmeal that makes it completely different? Well, yeah, I mean, oatmeal, I, I don't think I, I did mostly like kanji, but that kind of grain breakfast, yeah. you know, kanji yeah. is a kind of a rice soup, rice porridge that you take one cup of rice, but you could take oats, you could take whole oats, that is um, millet, you could take barley, whatever, and you take one cup and you put like 12 to 16 cups of water in. So it's, then, yeah, it's like a really uh, hydrated warm. grain. Yeah, so it's warm and wet you know, and mm -hmm. it's easy to digest. So it's not hard on your digestive system. But, you know, in the kanji world, which I guess you could do with oats, but oats are, you know, the, the meal is a little bit yeah. different than the growth kind of itself. Thicker, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can cook it with um, chicken broth or fish broth, maybe not 12 cups, but you add like 10 cups of, of water and then you, know, you put the chicken broth in. You can add in leftovers from dinner into it. You can mm -hmm. uh, poach an egg and put it on top. You can just cook it like kanji, this rice kind of porridge with uh, butter and honey. It's very good for just building chi. Um, you know, you can put vegetables in it. Typically in China, you'll put pickles in it. Um, mm -hmm. You can put red dates, you know, if you like a more sweet flavor and, and the sweet flavor is very nourishing and, and benefits the chi, which is that potential for our vitality. So th those are good things to add in. But the nice thing about this wet, warm breakfast is that your digestive system doesn't have to work hard to break it down. You know, it's mm -hmm. almost like a soup, you know, and so you get that nourishment without a lot of hard work. And some people don't have a big appetite in the morning, you know, or some mm -hmm. people or if you're recovering, especially like if you're recovering from COVID, you know, where you're a lot of, you have those oh, tail conditions that a lot of people have, where you're tired, you know, you, 
You can even put herbs in them. Sometimes we'll cook uh, kanji with astragalus, you know, which mm. is a chi boosting herb. There's another thing I do in the book, which is in every season, I make these essential seed and nut porridges. So they're a yeah. grain-free dish. Like I just had mine this morning, you know, and it, the winter one has uh, chia, flax, um, hemp, walnut, which is a very typical uh, warming nut, and cashew with a little sea salt. And you kind of, you, you'll roast them gently and then blend them up so they're kind of like almost like the texture of brown sugar and put in some um, unsweetened roasted like plantain chips. You can usually get them in a bag like Trader Joe's has them or, mm. and, and then you just add water and because of the chia and the flax and the hemp, it kind of gets this texture that's very much like oatmeal, but it's grain free. Wow. Yeah. So it's really yummy. I mean, I had it this morning um, with some butter and, and some honey. Uh, nice chi building for winter. And, well, then, and, it, and too, then with the nuts and seeds, you're getting some more protein than you would from a grain. And you're, exactly. They, with, you know, certain conditions, we you, people need to avoid grains. So, you know, right. more the nut and seed base. Uh, you know what? I've had something like that and I really, really enjoyed it. It's, it's, um, it's true. It's amazing how it does become like a, like a cooked cereal, but yes. it doesn't have the grain in there. This, I love that idea. And like you're saying, then you can do it a little differently based on the season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's also because of the essential fatty acids, Yeah, it really fills you up and mm. you don't need a big bowl, mm. you know, and it fills you up. And because of the fat, you're satisfied for much longer than with oatmeal. Like with oatmeal. Now, can you make a certain amount ahead of time? So you yeah, yeah. So I have like a big jar of it in my fridge. I, I doubled the recipe in my book, and it usually lasts me about a month. Okay, so then you don't have to keep mixing and grinding. You just have it done, and then you can just scoop it out each day. And um, Oh, I love that. And love kids that. love it. My friend's uh, kids really like it. So, you know, it's, you know you, and it's nice. Or you can sprinkle it in, you know, and you can kind of, you know trick your children and give mm -hmm. them some essential fatty acids. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They're they're If it tastes good, then they, they're like happy to have it. And then exactly. it all these extra nutrients in there. Yeah. Um, you mentioned also um, fermented foods that sometimes are added. Um, and you point out in the book that fermented foods have been used again for eons in Chinese medicine. Let's mm -hmm. touch on that a little bit because I think fermented foods are such a, so popular right now for people. We're realizing that, you know, getting some fermented or bacteria, bacterial cultures from our food can be very good. I always am very careful because sometimes, you know, when we hear something is good for us, we kind of overdo it. And I think with, with your, what you're teaching us, it really shows us that it's, you also don't want to, you don't want to overdo the spicy food. You also don't want to overdo the fermented food. So it's a matter of using a small amount to get the good, stuff but not underdoing it or overdoing it right exactly i mean that's the thing uh, you know americans have this you know more is better but it's never enough kind of thing you know and 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 that's where you know the overlay of of the eastern philosophy in chinese medicine it doesn't have to be either or you know we can add it in you know i think it's a beautiful overlay to western nutrition because it gives you the energetic perspective of it but, you know, the whole thing is about balance. I mean, you know, you mm -hmm. tell your patients, eat the rainbow, you mm -hmm. know, because if you get all the colors, you're going to get all the flavors. You're going to, you know, again, for your eye, just that, you know, contact with nature, it, it kind of, you know, we are aesthetic beings. We, are, we do respond to beauty, you know, and so the beauty on a plate makes us like, oh, that's really cool, you know. Something a lot of people don't know is that too much stress can actually create an abundance of health problems like high blood pressure, high blood sugar, anxiety, migraines, insomnia, even fertility issues. This is because high stress puts your adrenal glands on overload. 
They release cortisol and adrenaline, which controls your digestion, hormones, immune system, energy, focus, and even your emotional response. So how can you beat stress when you don't know where to start? That's why we have a free seven-day stress reset program. It's designed to help support weight loss, digestive healing, and hormone balancing. It includes support for integrating self-care, daily tips come to you by email and video, gluten-free, dairy-free meal plans, as well as grocery shopping lists, journal pages, and more. This free program will help you beat stress and put you on the path to wholeness in your body. Get your plan now for free at drdonnie.com. So it is about the balance, but you know, a little bit of fermented food every day, just you just bring that bacteria, that beneficial bacteria into your gut and your microbiome and building diversity there. And uh, Sandor Katz, uh, you know, who really kind of brought fermentation forward into the food culture in a, in a big way, um, his, his a couple of beautiful books, Art of Fermentation and mm-hmm. I can't, Wild Fermentation. Anyway, I was talking with him once and he was telling me about his trip to, to Asia and that mm-hmm. in China, it's, you know how like sourdough starters are a big thing? Yeah. There are people have in Sichuan, which is the province up near Tibet, you know, people covet their uh, fermented, you know, brine. Wow. And there was one person that had like brine that was like 2,000 years old or something, you know. So it's good. it's always been in culture. And and actually, when I was studying about fermented foods on for the book, sauerkraut actually came from China. I don't know how it ended up in, I think, uh, you know, Western yeah. China and then ended up in, you know, Germany kind of took hold of the the kraut thing. But, um, you know, there is a very, very long tradition and all cultures have it, you know, no matter Mexico, you know, Asia, Africa. Um, I remember growing up, my my friend's father was Polish descent and he was a merchant marine. And on the table, the kitchen, (laughs) there was this thing called Zud. And And it was this fermented rye kind of concoction. Of course, I was a kid, so it looked really weird to me. But now I probably <laughs> want to know everything about it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's really something when we we go, oh, wow, this is something that was someone way back when figured it out. And, you know, it's really it's helpful to our health. And um, so now we're getting the kind of the science and research to show that and to yeah. and to be able to come back, but also yeah, do it in a in a way where we can also recognize the the balance. Even with fermented foods, does it shift with the seasons and the? Let's say you know. I think we use different foods. Mm. You know, so like this morning, I was actually digging into my homemade pickles. You know, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh god, I was getting down to the bottom of the jar, and I went, oh, you know, I want to make some more, but I can't because pickling cucumbers come like in a short season every time of year, but, you know, certainly you can do a tremendous amount right now with root vegetables. Mm -hmm. You you can make quick pickles with uh, carrots, with uh, turnips, with uh, cabbage. Of course, you can make your own sauerkraut or you can make kimchi, you know, um, which is of course more Mm -hmm. spicy, but, or you can make quick pickles like Japanese tradition has, you know, a lot of these quick pickles. So you just press it with a little salt and it kind of helps to Um, break it down and the nice thing about a lightly fermented food is that it it the the breakdown has started so it's easier to digest Mm. you know because your body isn't having to like take a raw food and like warm it up and break it down you know and that makes your stomach work really really hard you know and from you know a lot of that hcl where get that fermented food in there it's already starting to break down and you know you already have a little bit of acid going in there as well so you know you can just do a little bit and it's really nice if you're having just a very simple meal to add just a little kind of pickle or a condiment Mm -hmm. Uh, and that would you know really um just kind of you know kind of get your attention you know what I mean yes it does and it, it kind of like um it gives different flavors in the food and it kind of mm-hmm. resets your palate a little bit. I notice, you know, Yes, it's like, um, again, it doesn't require very much, but it ha- it serves these different purposes. And, um, and I think it's a perfect example of, 
just by adding a little bit of something, how it can, this food now becomes medicine. It's helping us. Like what comes to mind is how we're so used to, we expect a lot of our bodies. We're used to it being hard. We almost expect that things should be hard and that our body should be able to handle it anyway. You know, like I'm supposed to be able to work all day and run through and get some fast food and eat it on the run. And, and what you're saying is, hey, how about we eat in a way that makes it easy for our body to digest and support our digestion? What about that? <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, what a concept, you know, to, to choose foods in a way that's going to help our bodies get more out of our food. Exactly. And it's, it's not just, you know, they say it's what you, it's, you are what you eat, but really we are what we digest, mm. you know, and it's not just what we eat, but how we eat, you know, um, gobbling down food on the run, like, you know, being on our phones or whatever is just like your body doesn't really know what's happening. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, we have to really, we, our body, we recognize that our body takes in all these signals, you know, from our environment. Am I sitting? Am I, am I calmly chewing and eating? And am I enjoying the food and, you know, the taste and everything? It's like completely different signals within our body so that it can have a chance to make the, like you were saying, the stomach acid and the pancreatic enzymes to be able to digest the food. Like it's a whole different experience. Yeah. And, you know, just want to bring it, I know you, you, you deal a lot with, with stress in your, in your practice and your writings mm -hmm. and such. And, you know, it's just very stressful to be, you know, just tense when we're eating. And, you know, eating is an opportunity for us to, you know, right now it's harder because people are having to eat alone and that brings up a whole other slew of issues. Yeah. You know, when life is normal or if you live with people, it is an opportunity to stop and mm -hmm. to rest and just to kind of share stories or enjoy your food or something to that effect, mm -hmm. which, you know, are, we're rhythmic beings. And we, as adults, we forget that. I always say, you know, for those of us who are parents, when we, when our kids were little, they were our little rhythm machines, you know, that's true. <laughs> you know, when they get to be teenagers, they go, Oh God, that rhythm is way off. But, um, but they you know, us. They, remind they remind us about rhythm because when they're hungry, they want to eat when they're tired, they want to sleep. And, you know, you know, like if you miss that window, they, their, their cortisol is like ah through the roof and they, you know, they just can't calm down. So <laughs> we're like that too, but we have found more adaptive ways. You know, we don't eat, we get really tired. We don't eat, we get grumpy. We don't eat, we get a stomach ache or a headache. We don't drink enough, we get a headache. You know, we're too tired and we can't go and we don't go to sleep. We get too wound up. So you know, the beauty of Chinese medicine is that it's a, rhythm, a rhythmic medicine. Mm. You know, we're looking at balance in regards to rhythm and activity and environment. And all of these things influence us and how we feel. So, you know, when we're eating, if you're eating and you're guilty, or if you're eating and you're miserable about your food, then stop, you know, <laughs> so, you know wait a minute, you know, food is not about guilt or mor morale. And I mean, there is a certain moral to morale to moral, sorry, not morale, moral to, you know, eating well, et cetera, just in terms of a lot of things. But, you know, if we, if we feel those things or we're depressed about our food, then, then it's time to look at things differently and, and look for ways where we can feel more comfortable more at ease, more fulfilled, more nourished, you know, in the, in the biggest sense of the word. That, yeah, that, that really brings that meaning to the word nourished, you know, nourished in yeah. many ways. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, you've mentioned um, COVID and, and maybe that's another good example of how can we be eating to support our immune system, whether it's preventing, mm -hmm. whether COVID or another virus, um, or say if you, when you catch a virus, what are some of examples of what you would suggest in that, in those situations? Well, our, you know, our immune system, since stress is so huge, um, and certainly we've all, the whole world is under stress now, you know, and there's a lot of trauma from this year that we're all been experiencing in, in various degrees. 
So it's it's kind of not what you eat, but what you cut out that's super important. And, oh. you know, <laughs> cutting out processed foods, cutting out sugar. Sugar will really depress the immune system. So mm-hmm. you know, a little treat every now and then is fine. But, you know, if you're just like binging on Oreos or, you know, whatever, or ice cream, it's just going to mess up your immune system. So, you know, and again, just those classic foods like, Greasy foods, fatty foods, creamy foods, creamy and cold foods like ice cream, lots of sugar, refined carbohydrates, um, fast food, processed, all of that stuff is going to put a stress on the immune system. So the immune system is going to have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And then it has to deal with what's out here, right? Mm -hmm. So if we kind of cut those things out, maybe, you you know, your listeners go, I can't do that. Well, take Mm -hmm. the big thing and cut that thing out. And add in some yeah. vegetables instead, you know. Um, dark green leafies, I can't tell you to eat enough of them. You can't OD on them. Mm. You know what I mean? Unless you have kidney stones that you have to watch out for kales and brassica kind of thing. So, But, mm-hmm. um, you know, vegetables, vegetables, and more vegetables are really good for you. Um, I encourage people to eat sea vegetables, seaweeds. Um, now, nori is really really high in protein there's tons of minerals in them like calcium and magnesium iron etc and a little bit of sea vegetables are really nice you know even like a slice of nori or some dulse which is a red kind of very salty rich with iron um, sea vegetable that you can kind of put in a salad or sprinkle over food things like that putting combo in beans that mineralizes that so Getting minerals into the system is really important. Um, bitter greens, which is not a big usual thing in our culture, but chicories, um, endive. Um, I love broccoli rob. A lot of people don't, but it's quite bitter. Right, it is a little bit bitter. Yeah. yeah. Those are really good because it helps to clear out any kind of heat buildup in the body. Um, again, if you're feeling healthy, you know, having a little bit of an immune boost in your um, like putting um, some astragalus in your um, mm. chicken broth that you're making, you know, and mm. ginger, red dates or goji berries actually are building chi and blood. So from a Chinese medicine mm. perspective, you can put that and they're They're not sweet, sweet tasting when you cook them in, in, a, in a soup. They're very, they're mild. Mm. Um, so I would those, also put goji berries in a soup. That, I'm going to try that. Yeah, it's really nice if you put in like a little and some mushrooms, mushrooms, mushrooms. I love mushrooms. the mushrooms. Oh my god! Mushrooms, gosh. we they found you know just have an incredible positive effect upon the immune system. So shiitake mushroom, maitake mushroom, oyster mushrooms, uh, cordyceps, um, which you don't find in the store, but you can get them from a Chinese herbalist. Um, okay. Or like the ultimate tonic. You can put those all in soups. You make a nice mushroom broth. It's a good immune boosting soup. You know, if you're starting to feel sick, um, I really recommend for people to speak with their naturopathic physician or their Chinese ac- acupuncturist, uh, Chinese medicine practitioner, and getting some herbs and some, you know, supplemental things to boost, you know. In addition the, to these dietary choices, yeah. Yeah, just because, you it's know. So powerful. It's yeah, and but also you know, COVID is is a beast, and um, you know that's really important to kind of catch it, nip it in the bud. But not overeating is also really important. Mm. So when people overeat and they're overtired. It kind of throws their immune system off, and they get sick. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, that yeah, it's, of- it is. It's, a, it's such a good point. Like I, I when I think of stresses, you know, even overeating would be a stress on your system because now your body yeah. has to deal with these extra calories so thinking about what are the things we might be doing to, you know to our bodies to ourselves that cause our cause our bodies to stress cause us to have to you know improvise or adapt and then and then it can throw you off balance like we've been talking yes. about so it's like just um what i'm hearing is the more we can kind of eat in a very balanced way now if a virus comes along it's coming at you when you're more in a balanced state so you're more able to respond and then you could add some extra immune supportive ways of eating but you're more starting off in a balanced place versus starting at a compromised place then you're more vulnerable to whatever comes along yeah 
And it doesn't uh, override, you know, all the public health recommendations of wearing a mask and, you know, washing your hands and keeping this distance. This is an addition that. to that. It's yeah. an addition because we've seen even people who were, quote, healthy, getting incredibly sick or even dying from COVID. So, um, mm -hmm. but Chinese medicine has been used effectively, I think, to help minimize um, effects. But you got to catch it like right in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some Chinese herbal formulas that people, different ones that different practitioners are using. Um, they've had some, you know, research in, in, in China on that too. So, you know, it's, a uh, it's a tricky time, but the most important thing is to just keep ourselves feeling as well as we can. You know, when we first got mm -hmm. on, you said, how you doing? I said, I'm hanging in, you know, and we want to hang in as best we can and be as resilient as we can in our immune system, in our digestive system, you know, in our mental, emotional state. So, you know, there are lots of kind of like you have to, all roads lead to Mecca, right? You have to just use all your resources and uh, supports that you can. Yeah. yeah, I love that. And just the idea that, that having a, you know, say if, if someone listening has been is is intrigued just by what we've been talking about, but if say you've been wanting to explore more with foods and different foods and different combinations in a way that's healing, then your book I think is really perfect because you you have just a a very gentle and simple way of getting to the details. So it's like um, I think a reader will feel very accepted. Um, and supported in your in this process in your book. So thank you so much. And it's available, I suppose, online anywhere people would usually get. Yeah, it, it's available on Amazon. And you know, I think if you're if you kind of look at it and go, oh God, I don't know. You don't even have to read the book if you just go to the recipes. You know, yeah. uh, all the seasons, and you can just learn. You know, to make these recipes in different ways and see what you what you're attracted to. Um, I also have a chapter where I talk about different conditions like anywhere from colds and flu to insomnia to PMS, etc. certain recipes that I recommend for you there. And then there's a whole chapter on condiments. So those little special things like we talked about fermented foods where you can just add mm -hmm. these little flavorings to, you know, therapeutic but yummy and add them to your um, to your meal. And so, sometimes yeah, that makes it yeah. more interesting because people sometimes will just be like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired of having the same, eating the same thing all the time. But when you can add a different spice or a different condiment or something, then all of a sudden it seems like totally different and new. Exactly. And if you're cooking for a family, not everybody in your family is going to eat the same. So if you have a mm -hmm. bunch of different condiments and a couple of choices, people can mix and match to their taste preference, you know? So I always tell moms one meal, don't cook, be cooking four meals for four people, you know, one meal, you know what I mean? It's, we had it's hard enough. Um, but yeah, you can get the book on Amazon. And I'm, you know, I, um, I love to talk to people or if they have questions, they can contact me at Ellen G at pearlnaturalhealth.com. I am in Portland, Oregon, where actually the sky is blue today. So that's really great. <laughs> Not raining today. Pearl no. Nat it's pearlnaturalhealth.com, right? Is yes. your website? Yes, pearlnaturalhealth.com. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm originally from Portland, so we kind of traded places because now I'm I, in New York. I'm you grew up in Portland. <laughs> oh wow. <gasps> <laughs> yes, wow. I was born there and grew up in the in the Northwest. Oh so. wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we did trade places. <laughs> I miss home. I don't know if you miss home, but I miss I miss New York. <laughs> Yeah, I do. I do. I love to come back and visit. It's, it's, um, you know, but that's the thing. There's, you know, there's something about that feeling of home. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure you've reflected on that too, you know, yeah. what, what goes into that. And I think with this pandemic, people have been at home more. And so I found for myself, it's more of a chance to reflect on that. What, what is being at home? And I think food is a lot of that, like what, mm -hmm. which foods you have available, which food you choose. And, and of course the people around you also gives you that sense of home, but there's, there is, I think also the part of the nature, like that's the difference I suppose between New York and the Pacific Northwest is the experience of nature outside too. Mm -hmm. You were alluding to the rain in the Pacific yeah. Northwest. 
yeah. the dampness, right? Yeah, but there's there's a lot of gorgeousness in New York, you know. I mean, I miss the smell of the deciduous forest, you know. Yes. Oh my gosh! And to see the the go through the fall where with all the leaves changing yeah. and and yeah. you know in the Northwest it's much more evergreen. Um, yes. which in some ways I like because then we get more green in the winter. But mm-hmm. here you get much more of that season change. The fall, you're experiencing the color. The winter, you're experiencing the, the cold and the snow and the ice. You know, so it's yeah. this, I've really come to um, appreciate that experience of season change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well, well, thank you so much for sharing with us today. And um, I think it's, really brilliant the work you're doing to to bring forward this ancient knowledge and wisdom of of food as medicine um especially what was studied in chinese medicine and bringing it into um our western culture so thank you for everything that you do oh well thank you it's always great to speak with a naturopathic uh, colleague thanks for listening to how humans heal If you liked this episode, leave a rating and a review. And for more resources, visit drdonnie.com.